Okay, so this month we are going to take a look at tool support for refactoring C++ source code. And this all originates because there was a Visual Studio add-on. I'm not going to shame them by naming them, but I'm just going to describe the experience. They created, uh, this was a company that had never made any C++ tools before, but they came out with a refactoring add-on for Visual Studio. And they had a giant laundry list of refactorings that they said they reported, that they supported, like, you know, 25, 30 different refactorings. And uh, I thought, wow, this is awesome. You know, finally we're going to get, like, you know, professional level refactoring support for C++ code. You know, when this it was feasible at the time because Clang was out, so you could there was an op you know there was Clang, there was GCC, uh, so there were at least two open source compilers that had a complete parser in there that you could use to build a refactoring tool around because you have to parse the language. You can't you know like regexes and you know ad hoc text matching. It's not going to cut it for C plus plus. No way. You're just going to fail. So it was feasible to create a refactoring tool using a real compiler front end. Um, and so the idea uh, of a refactoring tool that uses a, you know, an industrial strength refactoring tool, it has to parse the language as accurately as any compiler into an internal data structure. Then it modifies that internal data structure in accordance with the kind of transformation you're attempting to make. And then it, makes changes to your source code based on the modified structure. And usually there's some kind of interactive dialogue that you use to control what's happening. So for instance, the most common refactoring is rename. Take an identifier and change it from the name that it has to a new name that you are going to type in. Now, um, a, a refactoring, a strict definition of a refactoring is an operation, a transformation to your source code that does not change the semantics of the source code and it doesn't change the, the syntactical correctness of the source code, right? So before the refactoring, your code has a certain behavior. You know, if you're uh, a diligent developer, then you've created some kind of automated tests around the behavior of your code. And then you perform the refactoring, the source code is transformed somehow. And then you could build your code and run those automated tests, and they're all going to pass. Um, now, as I say, something like as simple as rename, which is the most, I, I would say rename is probably the most common kind of source code transformation that developers perform on a daily basis, because naming things is hard. And as you develop code and you start changing it, you realize, oh, I thought this name was good when I started out, but now I realize it's not really reflective of the role of this identifier in this context, so let me rename it and give it a better name. And if you've ever had to do that for you know, a non-trivial piece of code, something that's not just hello world, a single source file, it can start to get difficult to get all the references to that name updated and they end up being in referenced in surprising ways. So this company created this tool for C++ refactoring and I thought that was going to be awesome because I had a dusty deck pile of code which is a uh, started out as a 16-bit DOS program. Uh, it's a fractal generator called Fractin and I was refactoring that code to bring it to make it more modern and you know I had lots of things to do there like you know I wanted to you know extract functions I wanted to select lines of code and extract them into a function to make the code more modular you know so I didn't have a function that was like 8,000 lines long I wanted to have smaller functions that did one thing instead of an 8,000 line function that did just like all kinds of things and I started using this tool and I started transforming the code and I noticed that ev almost every time I applied one of their refactorings the code didn't never mind preserving the semantics it didn't even build and I started complaining in their user forum that their tool quality was low and they were like we don't know what you're talking about we have thousands of automated tests and they all pass and I was like 
I don't know what you're doing to test your code, but you're not testing any kind of real world scenario. Even even simple things don't work. It creates invalid code after the transformation. And they're like, well, you know, we have a hard time believing that. Why don't you go file some bug reports? So I created this test suite. Uh, does it tell me how long ago that I created this on GitHub? Probably if I look at like the first commit or something. But uh, I created this test suite as a way to track all the hundreds of bugs that I was filing against their tool. And after I filed all the bugs, which contained, you know, here's the source code. You do this transformation at this point on the, you know, this line number in this file. You do this transformation, and it produces code that doesn't compile or whatever it was. So I filed hundreds of bugs against their tool. And they were like, oh, wow, yeah, I see what you mean now. And then they started kind of working on a few of the bugs. And then they admitted defeat and withdrew the product from the marketplace right around the same time that they withdrew their product uh, refactoring support started showing up in other tools like Visual Assist X which is another add-on for Visual Studio uh, Visual Assist X added refactoring support and I was like oh well I'll just take this test suite and I'll run it against Visual Assist X and see how well they do and then uh, Visual Studio 2015 was the first release from Microsoft where the base product started to have some refactorings in it, started to have some limited support for rename, some experimental support for extract function, extract method. So I added uh, results of running the tests against Visual Studio. And then if you've um, ever been lucky enough to use a product called IntelliJ, which is a Java integrated development environment from JetBrains. Um, boy, that thing is just like super awesome at refactoring. And I don't know if it's something about the structure of Java code. Certainly Java code is easier to parse than C++. I think it's simply that their Java IDE is their oldest product and has the most advanced set of development features in it. That their refactoring support for Java code is very top-notch and just to give you an example suppose you have a class hierarchy that is where the classes are related through a pure virtual interface so you've got a, a, a class hierarchy implementing dynamic polymorphism right so you've got virtual methods and your application code is interacting with the virtual methods on the base interface and you've got derived implementations that supply the different strategies for whatever the, the specialization is in your class hierarchy I was working on a Java class hierarchy and I would do extract method in a single derived class. Then I would move that method from the derived class up to the base class. And then IntelliJ would say, hey, I did a structural analysis of the form of the method you just moved on to the base. And I noticed that you've got five, all, all the other derived classes in your hierarchy have that same code as a method in the derived classes do you want me to just drop the method from all the derived classes and, and because now that you've moved it up to the base they can just use the method on the base and that's an example of very high level assistance in refactoring from your tool it's you know and that kind of assistance in IntelliJ it's not doing a text compare it's not comparing the text of the implementation of the method to the implementations of the methods by the same name in all the other derived classes that were, you know, previously they were siblings. Uh, and they, they might be different implementations, but have the same signature because they're doing a, in which case it needs to be a virtual method in the base, right? Because it's, they ha it's a same operation that's implemented with different strategies in the different sibling classes that are all derived from the common base. So it may just say like, hey, I noticed you've got the same method named in all your derived classes. Do you want to make that a virtual method in your base and have all your derived classes override the virtual method in the base? Now, sometimes that's what you want to do and sometimes it's not, which is why it's great that it asks you. It doesn't just do it automatically without consulting you for uh, advice on whether or not this is the right thing to do, but 
that kind of level of assistance is extremely useful in restructuring your code as it evolves. Now, there's nothing for C++ that's that advanced yet, but we'll probably get there. Um, you know, I think the only reason that the refactoring support in IntelliJ is more advanced is simply, as I said, because they've been working on IntelliJ longer. It's their oldest product. It's been around for, I don't know, probably 25 years? Wikipedia will know. Wikipedia, IntelliJ, first release was 23 years ago. So IntelliJ has been around for a long time. If we look at ReSharper for C++, Uh, does it say when it was first released? Maybe if we just go to ReSharper. But ReSharper started... Uh, that's just taking me back here. ReSharper is another JetBrains product that provides uh, code development assistance for coding in .NET languages, C Sharp, hence the name ReSharper. And um, after Visual Assist X which is from Whole Tomato Corporation. After Visual Assist X came out with some support for refactoring, uh, JetBrains announced ReSharper for C++. Now I had used ReSharper for C Sharp programming, and it was just as enjoyable to use as IntelliJ was working on Java code. Um, and in fact, I'd used ReSharper before I used IntelliJ. Just depends on who I'm working for, what language they're asking me to write code in. Um, so ReSharp, ReSharper for C++ came out, and um, shortly after ReSharper for C++ was maybe a year or two, let's see if this has a Wikipedia page, JetBrains released a cross-platform, oops, spelled it wrong, cross-platform IDE called C-Lion. Uh, they're not listing dates that it was released. Okay, so we'll just talk about it. So uh, as, as I remember it, the, the timeline goes, Visual SysDex started offering some refactoring support, namely rename, extract method, extract function, extract variable, extract constant, things like that. Uh, then we got ReSharper for C++, and then a little while after that we got CLion, so I, I, I don't want this to be giving you the idea that the only way that you can get refactoring assistance from your source code is to use Visual Studio, because that's not the case. We'll talk, C-Lion is cross-platform, and uh, my personal recommendation is to use C-Lion as your IDE if you're on you know, Linux or Mac. Um, Xcode does have some refactoring support that they've also added to their IDE over time. Unfortunately, I don't have a Mac, so I can't run the tests uh, to find out how good the refactoring support is. Uh, we will look at these tests in just a moment and see what that what that looks like. But uh, so, uh, as I said, Visual Systex first, then. Um, Visual Studio started getting some things starting around 20, the Visual Studio 2015 release. So that's eight years ago at this point. Uh, we got ReSharper for C++ as an add-on for Visual Studio. Visual Sys X is an add-on for Visual Studio. Then we got CLion as a cross-platform IDE with uh, refactoring support. CLion is based on the IntelliJ core, so CLion is implemented in Java. So they can't quite share the same engine between the C-Lion IDE and the uh, ReSharper for C++. I believe the ReSharper for C++ engine is all written in C-Sharp. And based on their ReSharper engine add-on, uh, their ReSharper add-on for Visual Studio. So uh, as time progresses, then we got our first set of batch-oriented refactoring tools from the Clang project. We got, first there was a, pro, a project called Clang, excuse me, Clang Modernize. And the idea here was uh, when C++11 came out, 
it was recognized that what good are these new language features if it's not easy to use them and manually editing thousands of source files is not um, it's not a, you know a feasible approach um, so the Clang project created a tool called Clang Modernize and initially it just applied a few simple transformations uh, mostly around like range for loops uh, I think that might have uh, also had support for uh, replacing uh, you know disgusting looking types like stood double colon map open angle int comma stood double colon string close angle double colon iterator replacing things like that with just auto um, and Clang Modernize kind of went along for a little while and then there came uh, an, a, a project called Clang Tidy and Clang Tidy and Clang Modernize kind of existed simultaneously for a while the idea of Clang Tidy was to provide a lint type tool where it would use the abstract syntax tree process, uh, uh, built by the Clang compiler front end so we are using the internal data structures of the compiler to perform <coughs> excuse me to perform lint style code analysis static analysis uh, on our source code and because we're using the same data structure as the compiler we're not going to get you know some confused by parser errors or weird things like that so Clang tidy started out as a way to just say like hey I noticed there was this thing at this location in your source file you might want to take a look at that you know which is kind of lint or type tool right it issues a warning about something you're doing at some location in your source code that looks a little bit suspicious you know or you know potentially unsafe or what have you but clang tidy uh, got the clang modernize functionality incorporated into it and so clang tidy not just for the transformations that clang modernize was making but for any of its checks that it could apply to your source code it could issue what it calls a fix it which is a change to your source code that um, is recommended to fix whatever issue was detected so if you've used clang as a compiler you might have noticed that its error messages sometimes contain suggestions to change your code to correct or eliminate the error that was issued or the warning that was issued things like using a uh, assignment operator in the condition clause of an if statement it might suggest using comparison operator instead of assignment operator at, you know, in the warning message and that um, mechanism of suggesting using a comparison operator instead of assignment operator is internally implemented as a fix it and there's ways to tell clang you know if you can fix the the thing that you detected as a warning and the fix is re, you know reliable so it's not gonna change the meaning of my code uh, or it's not gonna you know adversely affect my code or I'm just gonna willing to opt in to the to the fixes that are suggested you can have those fixes applied back so clang tidy became a tool for identifying source code transformations and applying the necessary changes to get those things fixed I really hate Windows Update sticking things up on my screen at any rate uh, but Clang Tidy operates in a batch mode typically where you say I want to apply this kind of transformation like change my uh, find all my for loops that are using iterators that match the pattern for Clang Modernize and transform them into range based for loops so you can operate Clang Tidy in a batch mode on a source file and that works great another thing that you can do with Clang Tidy is you can restrict the range of source lines on which to operate and by providing that mechanism a lot of the IDEs now, uh, ReSharper, uh, CLion, I'm not sure if Visual Studio 
core has integrated Clang Tidy yet. They've integrated Clang Format. I, I think they might have integrated Clang Tidy as a way to analyze your code. I don't know if they will apply the fixits suggested by Clang Tidy. But the end result is that even though Clang Tidy itself is kind of written as a batch oriented tool, you can use it interactively and selectively apply fixes one by one if fixes are offered. And um, I've written a few, um, they're called checks, the individual use cases that Clang Tidy applies to analyze your code. I've written a few checks for Clang Tidy uh, based on things that I noticed in, you know, that I was manually doing, you know, fixing in code over time. So as time went on, this refactoring test suite that started out as just a way to prove that my complaints about the low quality of this unmentioned refactoring tool that's no longer on the market, um, it, it just a way to validate that my complaints were legitimate, has expanded into, um, oops, wrong one, let's go over here to the summary, has expanded into a test suite that I can apply to Visual Studio, I can apply it to Visual Assist X, ReSharper for C++. There's some refactoring support in Qt Creator. I haven't run any tests myself. Um, you know, someone ran two rename tests, which both failed apparently because of zero percent passing. Um, you see, I've got almost a thousand different tests for rename, and we'll see why there's so many tests just for rename. Um, but there's also the uh, Eclipse CDT, uh, the C, I think I forget what the acronym stands for, it's like C Development Toolkit or something like that. Um, so Eclipse says it's supporting some refactorings, and again, you know, one out of 56 tests were executed, and, you know, one out of 31 tests, one out of 13 tests, you know, two out of 19. You know, the ones they ran passed, that's nice. Um, but, you know, they're not really running the whole suite. You know, 12 tests out of a thousand rename tests and, and they, you know, they still failed some of those. Um, there's CLion, Xcode, and I've got tests in here for Clang Tidy. Now, not every refactoring tool supports all the refactorings that are in this test suite. So in this test suite, if it says NA for not applicable, that means that, to the best of my knowledge, this tool does not supply a way to perform the requested transformation automatically. Certainly, you can always edit code manually to perform these transformations. Um, but, you know, <laughs> if that's what we're going to do, we might as well just use VI, right? It, it, it's not really, the tool isn't assisting us if it's not doing something automatically. Now, uh, as I said, a bunch of these tools, because Clang Tidy is free and, you know, can be, you know, it has a permissive license. Uh, it's, the, it's the BSD license, I believe. It's either BSD or MIT. It's got a very permissive license. So people have taken Clang Tidy and bundled it in with their uh, refactoring tool. So I know ReSharper for C++ will suggest fixits from Clang Tidy, and so will C Lion. And since really it's just the functionality of Clang Tidy, when the functionality comes from Clang Tidy and not from the tool itself, I haven't reported those results for the for the tool because really you just kind of test you're just reporting results for Clang Tidy twice. Now you might say, hey, but uh, Clang Tidy provides equivalent of ad block delimiter, and and but I've got it reported for ReSharper even though ReSharper integrates Clang Tidy, and that's true because what was tested here was ReSharper's native facility for performing ad block delimiter instead of applying it through a Clang Tidy fix it. Uh, so that's just to clarify uh, the summary results here. So let's look at, you know, kind of the detailed results for a single tool here. And if, if you go look at the commit history on this repository, you see that I've been committing a lot of stuff over like the past three weeks. I hadn't done much on this uh, set of tests or the updated the results in about seven or eight years. It was way overdue. So this presentation just kind of motivated me to, you know, 
add a bunch more tests. We'll take a look at that in a second. You know, because C++, in, you know, the last time I refreshed this test suite, it, I had gotten it to, like, C++11. So I didn't have um, changes introduced in C++14 or 17 or 20. I, I still don't have anything in C++23. C++23 is mostly kind of a bug fix release, though. They're doing that process where they're making major changes every other release and then issuing the next release as a bug fix. So you can kind of consider C++14 a bug fix on C++11. And uh, C++ then C++17 introduced new features and C++20. Uh, well, 20 introduced some new features that also, you know, was kind of, you know, not trying to be as, as big a change as 17 and so on. Um, so I'm still a little bit behind, but uh, we've got a lot more uh, coverage for modern language features for rename, which I think rename is the most important thing because that's what you do most. And what you see here at the top of each uh, results for a particular tool is I've got this little notes section where I'm saying, you know, how am I doing add block delimiter? Well, in uh, ReSharper for C++, they have what they call quick fixes. Or sometimes, I think they kind of keep changing their terminology slightly. It might be called a quick fix or it might be called an action. And so this is what I am applying within ReSharper uh, in order to perform this refactoring. Um, and then, you know, there might be some additional notes about, you know, if the, it, you know, the circumstances under which things are more likely to succeed or which they're, you know, likely to fail or kind of, into, you know, problems or things, the things to watch out for. Um, and ReSharper's got pretty good uh, support in terms of uh, the number of refactorings that they're supporting here, not getting things through Clang Tidy. If you're curious, um, the way this repository is arranged is this refactor test directory is where all the source files are that contain the, the test cases. We'll take a look at those in just a moment. And then, oops, let's go back here. Uh, and then uh, the results directory is where I've got uh, the reports for the individual tools and, and whether there's test cases pass and then these other directories contain source code for uh, some utilities that I've written for analyzing the reports and making you know making sure that um, for a tool if it lists you know some test cases that it lists all the test cases that are mentioned in the source code and we'll, we'll see how the test code how test cases are annotated in the source code in a second. So you can see here, you know, these are just the results for individual test cases. Now, um, I try to file bug reports for test cases that fail and then put links to those bug reports in the markdown for the individual tool. And um, you, you can see there's a bunch of links in here. Um, and then, you know, so you don't have to read the details of every bug report to see, you know, generally what was the problem. I try to put, you know, a short summary in parentheses after the word failure to indicate what the problem was. You know, here you did the refactoring and it modified some unrelated code, which it shouldn't have. Um, or, it, you know, it created invalid code. Invalid code means after I applied the automated transformation and I do a build, I get a compile error. Right. So it's syntactically invalid, um, which you don't want, you know, that's, that's bad. Um, usually when you invoke a refactoring interactively in the IDE, the, you know, the, the IDE syntax analysis alerts you almost right away that it, you know, it, it's not going to build. Um, but this can be, you know, this can be difficult. This means, you know, maybe stay away from this scenario using this automated tool, if you're going to apply it to hundreds and hundreds of source files, which it can do in the IDE, but what good is it if it modified hundreds of files and now they, they all don't build? You might as well just 
uh, you know, go get yourself a fresh cup of coffee and do the refactoring manually. Um, and I'll explain a, a technique you can use to do refactorings manually to, to you know, to make sure that you're not uh, creating invalid code accidentally from manual edits. But ideally, you know, hey, let's do an automated tool. If we can, it's going to save us work. Um, okay, so you can see, you know, I've got not every refactoring has, you know, tons of test cases. Some of them just, you know, have some basic test cases to cover the basics. You now, sometimes the the uh, refactoring is such that it, it just, you know, doesn't do a whole lot. Uh, so there's no need to have, like, you know, hundreds of uh, test cases for it. So um, let's take a look at what the code looks like in Visual Studio here. So let's bring this window over here so you can see. Okay, so as I said, I've got some libraries. Um, I've got tools, this refactor test suite. Initially, I just was testing that the code after you refactored it, I was just testing that the code built. Let's make this bigger. And then I realized you can erroneously transform source code in such a way that it still builds, but you change the meaning of the code. So over time, I have tried to add runtime tests to the source code that is being refactored so that if you accidentally change the meaning of the code, even though it builds, the runtime tests will catch the change in semantics and cause a runtime failure. Uh, I'm using CMake to build all of this stuff and the way that I've ensured that the test suite stays error free is um, in CMake if you do uh, add custom command with the post build keyword you can add uh, commands that execute after a successful build of the target. So what this highlighted line in CMake is saying is after you've successfully built this target called refactor test suite, run refactor test suite every time you build. And refactor test suite's runtime behavior is such that if any of the expected runtime behavior has changed, then it returns a non-zero error code, which results in a failure, which results in your build failing. So the code compiled, that part was successful. Then it runs the runtime check as part of the build. And if the runtime checks are successful, then the build was successful. I've added two other uh, post build commands this uh, test names uh, and test diffs. These are two tools that I wrote to make sure that um, the names used in the tests are kept consistent and um, it generates a markdown file in the build directory. Um, this uh, test diffs, it will give an error if you've added a test case but haven't created a diff file for the test case. And we'll look, we'll see what that means when we, when we start to look at the test cases in a moment. Uh, but if you're going to add a new tool and you want to get a starting point uh, for the markdown file that reports the results for the tool, you can use this tool.md as a starting point. If we browse over here to my build directory and look at tool.md, it's a markdown file that doesn't contain any results, but it lists every test case that's present in the source code. So you can use this to uh, create new results file for a new tool that you want to add to the set of tools for which results are reported or known. Or you can use it to copy and paste the new um, markup to results for an existing tool when you add new test cases. So what does a test case look like? Let's look at a really simple one first. So this uh, test cases library is my 
library of source code that analyzes the test cases themselves to, to be able to generate reports and do some error checking. The refactor test cases library contains the source code for individual tests and, and add block delimiter is a really simple set of tests so we look at that. Each one of these files has like a just a comment up at the top that says you know what does this refactoring do? Well it, it you know we're adding or removing block delimiters to source code and then this uh, pound test pound inside a comment I mean it doesn't as far as my little checking tools are concerned it doesn't have to be in a comment but if it's not in a comment it's not going to compile so it's it's always appears in a comment this uh, indicates that there's a test to be performed and it usually is on the line immediately following uh, this ABD1 that's the identifier for the for the test case and then these are instructions to tell you what to do to exercise the test. Now, it'd be great if I could find a way to automate running these tests. <laughs> and it's just not really feasible because somebody has to look at the code changes that are produced and decide if those code changes are correct. Um, because as I said, I, I added the runtime checking um, later. And so not everything validates results. You can see here, this code, it's modifying variables and it's returning a value, but nothing validates the return value of this function to validate that the semantics didn't change. And there's, you know, complex, crazy branching and looping going on here. So I certainly don't have test coverage that's pushing down into all these uh, alternate control flows. So, um, you know, it's, it says add, add delimiters. What, is it, what does that mean? It means, means something like if I select this block and then I can, uh, oops, I need to do it this way. I go up to here and I'm pressing Alt Enter to get the resharp or quick fixes. And you see there's a quick fix here called add braces. So if I do that, it applies braces around the single statement that represents this true condition of, of this or the true block of this if statement and it was smart enough to say like hey that comment goes with this statement so put the braces around um, both lines not just the code line so uh, actually I think this I think this add braces I can't remember if it's coming from Resharper or Visual Studio, because Visual Studio also has the ability to add braces. So I've turned off the Resharper extension now. And now if I look at quick actions, no quick actions available here. So it was coming from Resharper. Go back here and turn Resharper on or resume. Uh, so that's how. If we go back and look at this, uh, that's how I know that add block delimiter came from the add braces quick action from ReSharper. That's how I know it came from ReSharper and not from Visual Studio. If we go back and look at the Visual Studio results, add block delim delimiter is available by selecting a block of code and typing open curly brace. So if we go back here to this code, I can select these two lines, type open curly brace, and it surrounds it with braces. It surrounds the selection with braces. And I can go in here and I can do it again, you know, and just keep adding more braces if I want. Uh, Resharper has the corresponding remove braces. Now, that's what it looks like to execute a test manually. But there's more to it than that. Uh, let's get this up. Oh, no, I already have one. Okay, let's go back over here. This is better. We use this one. Okay, so here in the test suite, you know, right now I haven't modified anything. So I go over here. I want to run this test manually. So I go over here. I say add braces. I save the file. Now I can look at a 
a difference in Git, and it shows me, yes, the braces were added where I expected, and nothing else changed. Okay, but that's still kind of tedious to go through each of these individual test cases, of which there's probably, I don't know, there's almost a thousand test cases for rename, so that alone is, is a big ask of someone to contribute test results back. So can we, can we do something better? Well, what I've tried to do for every test case in the results directory, there is a diffs folder. And if we look in this folder, let's turn paging on, you can see that there's a file for every test case, and that is the expected diff to the source code when that test is considered to have succeeded. Okay, so let's take a look at results. Let's, we can just open it over here. We can take a look at results, diffs, ABD1. So it's saying, I mean, this is a diff that I, it's just produced by git, right? Same as, same as when I was over here and I said git diff, right? So it shows this line was added, this line was added, these lines are for context, and this little double at thing is saying the lines that were changed was beginning at line 11 for a chunk of eight lines there was a, rem a, a removal and then there was addition at beginning line 11 of 10 lines and it was within the context of this function called int add block delimiters and the changes that the change was made to this file. Sometimes a refactoring will change multiple files, in which case the diff will contain differences for all the files that were changed as a result of that test case. Uh, and also in the results folder, I have a little scripts directory that contains just simple batch scripts that I've created to assist me in checking all these results. So I've got a script called check where I can give it the name of a test case. It will do a diff on my working directory, capture that into a file, and then compare my diff to the diff that was recorded for that test case's success, successful change. Right, so if I say check abd1, it compared my diff, the diff of my workspace, which you put in, you know, c colon temp diff dot text. I mean, these scripts, they might not work exactly for you out of the box because I've just created them to work for me. And the, uh, the diff that was recorded in the results directory came in on standard input. So compare these two and it says they're different. It says this line here is different from this line here. But if we look closer, we see that, oh, what's different is the starting line number of where the change was applied. Otherwise, they're the same. And if we take a look at this script, you can see it does a git diff. It tries to filter out some stuff that's just going to generate possibly extra things for you to have to manually validate in the diff creates that local file. Um, it does a sanity check to make sure that a diff exists for the test case you're asking to compare it against. And then it says comparing diffs for that test case. Again, tries to scrape out a few things from the diff that was recorded to just kind of try to minimize the amount of noise so you don't have to look at things that changed but aren't consequential for the um the the actual change I probably you know for i probably should not do this now that i think about it uh, remove all lines that contain a slash slash comment because you might have an inline comment you know you know int x equals three foo or something like that in which case that entire line would get dropped off um, so i probably shouldn't do that technically speaking but um this index thing is coming from git, right? If we look at, if we look at git diff, it, this index thing 
these are the git hashes that are relevant to the diff that you're displaying and that's just never relevant for uh, fixing or, or comparing test results because the git hash is just going to keep changing and you're always going to get differences uh, for the for the git hash but probably shouldn't probably should fix this script and not do this uh, scraping out of the comment lines at any rate um, the idea is that this will assist in you know say I go back here to add block delimiter and let's just add another set of delimiters in there and now let's say check ABD1 so it should fail now and now we see that my diff has extra changes in it that aren't in the original diff which is you know so this is the truth for this test and my diff contains extra changes so that would be a failure um, and then a common thing you have to do after every test case is restore your workspace back to pristine um, to a pristine state to apply the next test run so you're gonna end up doing like git restore to refactor test that reverts all the changes that I made to the source code and you may have updated your you may have recorded the results of the test that you just ran in your uh, you know clang tidy results MD you may have modified that so I had a uh, script called restore it just make sure that you remember whatever results that you recorded it doesn't commit them to git it just adds them to the set of stuff to be committed at some later point and restores the uh, source code uh, back to normal state so if I say restore and it, it has a clear screen in there just because you know I like stuff to be up at the top so I'm, I'm not distracted by other junk on my screen that's not relevant to the test case that I am checking at the moment so that's basically the mechanics of how you would go through, exercise these tests, compare them against some kind of um, truth, you know, for the test, some kind of result of changing your source code that's considered to be correct. Um, and I didn't initially have like the diffs, and so you checking that the results were correct involved a lot of manual reading of the diff and manual inspection of the code what changed you know was it really the, the the changes that should be made and I think it's a lot easier now that I've recorded a diff for every test case you may have noticed if you were eagle-eyed oops let's turn paging back on if you were eagle-eyed when you looked at this listing of this directory you may have noticed there are some diffs that are in a zero length file and that's because sometimes what we want to test let's go look at that test case AO4 so AO is add override so the idea here is you've got a virtual method that is derived from uh, it's a method that's intended to override a method in the base class but you haven't used the override keyword which was introduced in C++11 right so before C++11 C++ you had to indicate that you were overriding a method on the base class using the virtual keyword however if you made the mistake of writing the keyword virtual but you did not write the function signature correctly so any arguments or whether the function has or method whether the method is const or whether the method is volatile if you didn't uh, you know exception specification might be part of that no except if you didn't get the function signature correct your intention was that you were going to override the method but instead what you did was overload the method so the derived class provided a method overload that was not present in the base class and therefore when you called uh, the implementation through the base class pointer you didn't get into the intended override in a derived class now somebody had to override it or you would get the pure virtual 
uh, compilation error. It cannot, it could, it can't instantiate a peer, any class that has a peer virtual method that hasn't been implemented. So, but but it's possible to make this mistake. So they, that's why the override keyword was added, and the example here is you know. Um, you can see the quick fix that it really wants to suggest to me is add override specifier. And this is coming from, here you can see an example of where the check is, uh, the action to correct this is provided by ReSharper. That's indicated by the fact that it's got this little balloon here. But also there's um, a, a clang. It's offering, uh, I bet I've got, use over the, the clang modernize use override is probably off by default in the set of suggestions that resharper is offering but you can see that there were also suggestions in there coming from modern oh here it is modernize use override clang tidy check you can uh, if I play it this way uh, oh they've got that as an inspection but it's not going to apply it's not going to apply the result. It's just an inspection here. Um, so it's not going to use the fix it from Clang Tidy because they've got the 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 fix it is implemented directly in ReSharper. At any rate, if we if we say add override specifier, oh here we go. Apply Clang Tidy fix. So if we did it this way, we got it from Clang Tidy. If I undo that, if I use Let's get the cursor in the right place. Oops. If we use the little light bulb, add override specifier, that's coming from ReSharper. But we were interested in the test case with the zero length file. So what's going on there? Well, here, the test case is indicating that this transformation should not be available. Why should it not be available in this case? Because Although this is a virtual method, there's no such method. See, this is signature is setter, returns void, and takes a float. That's the signature of this method. There's no corresponding method with the same signature in the base class. There's a setter that takes a void, or sorry, returns a void, and takes an int, but there's not one that takes a float. So in this case, add override should not be available from any automated tool because if we add the word override on here and drop the keyword virtual it's a syntax error right function has the override specifier but does not override a base class member so that is why some of the diff files are zero length now like anything that evolves, sometimes you find out the thing you were trying to test, you know, just it didn't make sense or, you know, it was just kind of a dumb test case and you want to you want to drop it. So for those oh, let's just do it this way. Let's just say current project start at CPP for a test case that's been dropped I didn't want to renumber all the test cases that followed and I didn't want people to be confused about why the test case numbers skipped one so there would just be a test marker in whatever source file and the test case will be marked deprecated and then over in uh, the results file for any tool if we go over here to resharper you see that the test case is marked deprecated as well the result just just to keep things consistent and that way when you're you know skimming through test cases in the results you're like wait why does you won't be asking yourself why did it skip a number does that mean that they didn't run the test um, so they're the deprecated tests are kind of the idea is kept around but y there's nothing that you need to do for those now I said that I had you know 
<clears throat> almost a thousand test cases for rename. And you might ask yourself, like, you know, why does rename need so many test cases? Well, let's just look at this one little snippet of code here. So this is C11 code. Uh, we have a function that declares its return type auto so that we can use trailing return type syntax, which was introduced in C11. And we can use decal type on an expression. And the reason we have to use trailing return type is that the elements of the expression refer to arguments declared in the function signature. So we can't put that up front because we haven't even mentioned the identifiers x and y yet. Uh, this is a template function, template member function, that's using auto return syntax to use the trailing return type so that we can use decal type to refer to the names that are declared as the types, sorry, the, refer to the names that are declared as the arguments to this function. Um, so it, it, prior to C11, it was just nearly impossible to get this function signature to be correct. But you can see, you know, we've got the identifier that's the name of this function. That's this test case up here, rename the function. Here we've got test cases to rename the names of the template arguments to this template function. So this name T is referenced here in the argument list. Uh, the name u is also referenced there. Um, so we, we can rename the function. We can rename the names of the template arguments. We can rename the template arguments from their usage in the parameter list. We can rename the names of the parameters. We can rename the names of the parameters from their usage in the decal type. And we can also rename the names of the parameters from their usage in the body of the function. And you might ask yourself, like, you know, why don't you just, why, why go through all that trouble? Why don't you just rename it from the place where the identifier was introduced? If you want to rename the template argument, rename it from the template argument list. And the answer is, your code isn't always two lines long. And when you want to rename something, you're in the middle of, of editing some piece of code and your cursor is on the identifier and that's the thing you want to rename and you want to rename it right there and you just want to make sure that all the places where it is mentioned elsewhere get appropriately renamed. So if we look at the diff for say uh, R568 You can see that uh, I'm using this identifier goink <laughs> as my stand as my placeholder for all the identifiers whenever I rename something um, just because I know that that identifier doesn't appear anywhere else in my code and um, so all the all these all these diffs for rename they all work around that so you can see here that we renamed the parameter uh, from its use in the decal type expression and we expect that the parameter will be renamed in the argument list and the parameter will be renamed in the body of the function where it's used. So that's why there are so many test cases for rename because all these names are connected syntactically to other pieces of code. And a rename operation, you should be able to perform it on any name anywhere that it appears. Now for uh, we'll just look at the CMake lists for this little library here. So here's the main stuff with all the C++11 stuff, all the source files for that. And then when you're building this test suite, you may not have a C++ compiler or an IDE that supports C++14. It may not support C++17, and it may not support C++20. Furthermore, um, I don't want to force a minimum C++ standard on all the source files because things in C++11 may have gotten deprecated in a later version of C++. For instance, dynamic exception specifications. Those have been deprecated 
and eventually they get removed. The language feature gets deprecated and eventually removed. Garbage collection, for instance, has been deprecated and it may have already been removed. I don't, I don't actually know anybody that used garbage collection from C++, but the, it was in there and that's been deprecated. I can't remember if it's been removed or not. Uh, cppreference.com will tell you for a particular feature, you know, which version of C++ it was added and how it was changed in the various versions. Usually they change by adding. They try not to deprecate or remove anything, but some things have been deprecated and removed. So for C++14, we've got special C++14 syntax that it uh, pertains to renaming identifiers. We've got special C++17 syntax that pertains to renaming identifiers and special C++20. Now, I looked at uh, 23, and I didn't see anything obvious that introduced new language syntax that could introduce new identifiers that could be renamed and have to be looked at in a, in a, in a C++23 context. But um, let's just take a look, for example, at what kind of stuff showed up in C++20 that introduced new syntax where identifiers could appear that could be renamed. So uh, I made a little checklist here. I haven't done the two big ones that I haven't done yet are modules and concepts, but uh, uh, and there's uh, co-await uh, for coroutines. I haven't gotten to that yet, but I've done all these others. So spaceship operator. Uh, let's collapse this so you can just see, you know, so here's use of spaceship operator. Um, designated initializers. That's new syntax that can reference identifiers. Init statements and initializers in a range for loop. Explicit template parameters in lambdas. Pack ex temp uh, so packs are for variadic template functions. So now we can have pack expansions in lambda init expressions that are used to uh, capture values. Uh, we've got const eval, const init. We've got aggregate initialization using parentheses instead of curly braces. Coroutines, modules, as I say, I haven't done anything modules yet. I haven't done anything for constraints and concepts yet. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, this uh, abbreviated function template, you can, you can look these things up in CPP reference. That's pretty much what I use for my reference to build this list of stuff that I should cover. And you can see that this, just this stuff for C++20 resulted in another 500 lines of code um, going down to test case 9... 986, I think, is the last test case mentioned here, and the first one is like, uh, you know, 850 or something, or 840. So we added like, you know, 100 or so test cases just for C++20. And you might say like, yeah, some of this is being a little bit paranoid. If I could rename X compared to X, why would I not be able to rename X compared to Y? And I'm like, well, I don't know. They're different identifiers. Maybe, you know, maybe renaming X compared to Y works, but comparing X to itself doesn't work. But there's no reason that the rename tool shouldn't work for everything. It's hard to anticipate, um, you know, without being the implementer of a tool, I don't know what test cases to create to push the testing down into every nook and cranny of the tool. But I do know that kind of general software engineering approach to testing is, you know, you test zero, one, and many. You know, so here's like the zero case, here's the one case, and then it should be reflexive. You know, so I should, so whether Y comes first or whether X comes first shouldn't matter. I, I mean, there's no N case for spaceship operator because it only has two operands. Um, but you've got, you know, in all these little bits of syntax that get introduced, you know, names just kind of pop up everywhere. So here's the name of a field. You know, this is a struct that has X, Y, and Z in it. And if I rename this struct member X over here, this X over here better change because otherwise I created invalid code. So even though you might look at this code and you say like, oh, there's nothing C++20 going on here. This is just a struct with members in it. I should be able to rename this and it shouldn't be a problem. Well, your tool better understand 
designated initializer syntax and catch that identifier and understand that these are referring to the same thing and that this identifier should also be updated. There's also a chronic problem uh, with refactoring tools with respect to arguments to macros. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. You know, so if I rename, that, that's why you'll see uh, rename test cases where, you know, what's the big deal going on here? Well, this X is an argument to a macro, and it refers to the member of this struct that's being initialized with a designated initializer. So that's why there ends up being so many test cases for rename. You have to kind of come at things from all different angles. Um, so I guess that's enough talking about test cases. What you probably want to know is who wins. Uh, so let's go over here. Here we are. Okay, so if we go back here to this, uh, oops, let's go to the top and go to this uh, summary results. I have I haven't uh, sorry I haven't I haven't updated this part of the README yet to refer to the actual versions because I kind of would I, I I haven't finished manually testing everything in Sea Lion. Um, I reran all the tests for Clang Tidy, for ReSharper for C++, for Visual Studio, and for Visual Assist X. So those results. Uh, have been updated as of the currently available versions of these tools. So Visual Studio is Visual Studio 2022. Whatever the current update is for Visual Assist X, I downloaded it like a week ago, so it's the current version. For ReSharper for C++, I have a subscription to that, and I have the current version for that. Uh, for C-Line, I downloaded the version, uh, the most current version yesterday, and for Clang Tidy, I went and downloaded that from the uh, GitHub releases page for LLVM project, and that's, uh, it's like 1706, so that's like a very, very recent version of Clang Tidy. So, you know, you can kind of stare at this table to kind of figure out what's what, but the clear winner is ReSharper for C++. Um, I don't know what Visual Assist X is using for its parsing, but it gets very confused about a lot of things. Um, and the main place where it falls down is it has a tendency to select every occurrence of a piece of text as a thing that should be changed when you're trying to rename something. And I'll show you why that's a big fail. If we look at the rename test cases, uh, let's find a template. Okay, it's very common to have a template function or template class where the name of the template parameter is T. And but later we realize, yeah, you know, it's not really, you know, T is probably, you know, it's it's a stand-in name, but it's not a good name for what's actually going on in this function. So what if I wanted to rename it to result instead of, if for this particular function, if I want to rename it to result instead of T. And here, ReSharper, it's by default, it searches for usages and comments and strings. We only care about changing code. So, okay, I've changed this to result. Uh, and it's, you know, the type of the result is the t same as the type of the first argument. That's, you know, kind of useful to know from looking at the signature. But most importantly, uh, template, do I have another template in here? Apparently I do not, so let's just go find another one over here. Okay, but what's important is this T on this template member function Oops, this is the F3. And this T on this template function have nothing to do with this T that I just renamed. They're absolutely nothing in common other than they just happen to have the same text. So if you have a refactoring tool that just does text matches, it throws up 
too many suggestions that are incorrect of things that it wants to change. And by default, Visual Assist X will have those suggestions selected for change. And their answer is to this complaint, their answer is, well, you should be going through them and deselecting the ones that don't apply. Well, this project here that I have isn't even particularly big. And the list of suggested changes is hundreds and hundreds of instances of the identifier T. Now, sure, a bunch of them are in comments and in strings. And I can deselect the option that says don't scrape up the identifier out of strings. And that gets rid of a bunch of them. But, you know, for every single template function that I have where I've used T as the template parameter name, it wants to suggest those to be renamed and that's why out of almost a thousand test cases Visual Assist X can't get above 70 percent because and I explained my methodology that um, uh, or maybe I didn't I need maybe I need to go back and add that uh, by default I just do I, I use the selection that's suggested by the tool if I have a large code base, I can't review thousands and thousands and thousands of scraped up identifiers that just happen to match by text. That's not useful. That's, that's not assistance. That's a burden. And that's why Visual Assist X for rename gets such a poor score. It often wants to greedily rename things that are completely unrelated and my only conclusion is that whatever they're using to analyze my source code is not smart enough it's certainly not as smart as my compiler to be able to identify these two ad things that happen to have the same name are completely unrelated and completely uncoupled now you'll notice that resharper gets 98 percent it's got the, the the highest score of anybody that's completed all the tests. Yeah, over here, uh, Xcode got 100%, but it only ran one test out of 986. So that, you know, that's not particularly useful. Uh, Visual Studio didn't do too bad at 90%. Um, over here, C Lion, this is C Lion. I haven't run all the tests yet. Um, I only have results for 605 out of the 986 but C line it's it's probably gonna come in at number two if not uh, yeah it's probably gonna come in at number two after resharper for C++ which consistently in all the times I've been gathering test results resharper for C++ just comes out the best on on everything um, Visual Studio it's not bad at 90 percent um, the big bummer about Visual Studio is, uh, and again, this is where I noted that, when applying an operation, the default selections on any prompting dialogues were used. So I, I am I'm doing what the tool suggests. And, you know, if you, um, if you can't get an accurate set of suggestions by default from the tool, you might as well just do the refactoring manually. Um, and I'll mention how to do refactorings safely manually in just a second. But I want to come down here to this final observation about Visual Studio, which is the most disappointing, which is that I, uh, you know, ran Visual Studio against my test suite, you know, six years ago or seven years ago. The I think it was 2018. So was that five years ago? The last time, uh, it might have been seven years ago. At any rate, um, the last time I updated this uh, test suite in a significant way and ran, you know, all the tests manually against each of the test cases, for all the things that it got wrong, I opened a bug report and, uh, oh, I wrote that it reported in 2017. So that's when I uh, last did a comprehensive manual run of testing against these tools. Uh, so we were overdue for another run. Um, but I reported all these bugs, and not a single bug was marked fixed. Not a single bug was operated on in any meaningful way. And my experience with Microsoft, unfortunately, 
is that they are managing their bug reports by metric. So somebody inside Microsoft is punishing teams for having a large number of open bugs. So their QA team is in a rush to close all the bugs as quickly as possible. And I, I, that's just been my experience, whether I'm reporting a bug against Visual Studio, or reporting a bug against any Microsoft product, is they just rush to close the bug. And I can't even tell if they attempted to reproduce the issue that I was reporting. If they say that they can't reproduce it, they don't say what they did. So I don't have any confidence that they actually did the same thing that I did for which I got the problem. So my sad conclusion is that it's a waste of time to file bugs against Microsoft products at this time. Uh, until they change the way they're managing their bug database, uh, it just seems to be a huge, it's a waste of my time to create reports for which they're never going to do anything. Now the irony is that some of the test cases that previously failed now pass. But even for those test cases, if I go back and look at the bug that I filed against it, there was no indication on that bug report that the issue was fixed. It was just, typically it was like, well, we want to close all these open bugs and you haven't said anything on the bug for two weeks, so we're just going to close it. And I'm like, but why? W what is the benefit to that? Contrast to ReSharper for C++ or C Lion. Uh, you can go back and look at some of these where I've filed a bug. Maybe the bug's been open for eight years. So what? Who cares? You know, you haven't fixed it yet. That's the important thing. So just because the bug has been open for eight years, you know, I'm not a moron. I can figure out it's not a high priority for you. But having the bug open, if a bunch of other people start hitting the same problem, they can all come in and they can vote that bug up. Keeping it open means it hasn't been fixed. Closing it just for the sake of closing it due to inactivity is dumb. That's what happens when you manage a team by metric. Somebody at Microsoft is measuring a team by the number of open bugs they have, so they are in a rush to go and close these bugs no matter what. They haven't done anything. They haven't fixed anything. They're not going to fix anything. You know, at, at least be honest to say, you know, won't fix. But don't just close it because there hasn't been any activity for a while. So, uh, sad to say, uh, at least in recent years, reporting bugs on Microsoft products, at least the, the Visual Studio related products, just feels to be a complete waste of time. Now, uh, Visual Assist, they don't have, uh, when I, I haven't, I did, I did update the results. Uh, I ran all these, I reran every single one of these test cases manually. Uh, I haven't filed new bug reports for the failure cases yet. Um, however, my experience is, at least in the past, from around 27 time, 2017 time frame, um, their bug database is not publicly visible. It's not like a GitHub issues page. It's not uh, some kind of bug tracker like U-Track for where JetBrains runs their, they have their own bug tracker product called U-Track, which they use. And you can set the visibility of your bug in case you're reporting something where you've got proprietary code, you know, attached to the bug or in the bug description or anything like that. But most of the bugs, in fact, all the bugs that I've filed for this test suite, they're all publicly visible because the test suite is open source. So, you know, who cares? But uh, those bugs are open and visible. But I believe the last time that I reported bugs to Visual Assist, uh, you did it by making a post in their discussion forum and then they created a case ID associated with that but their case ID and their bug report stuff it's all completely internal to the company so we can't see it from the outside they, that may have changed um, since the last time I was uh, reporting bugs to them and I will go back and report these failures to them uh, so that they can improve their product uh, Visual Assist X does many things besides refactoring and it, it is good on the, it, when I've used it, it, it was good on the non-refactoring support and that is mostly around things like quickly creating code from templates. 
So the idea is I do something like I type in a call to a method that doesn't exist and then Visual Syst X will create a new method declaration and implementation from the context of this new method call that I've written that doesn't for which you know the method doesn't exist yet. It's good at those sorts of things. It's good at code navigation. It's good at uh, showing me high level views of my code. Um, and it's not bad at refactoring. It's not crap. It's just not as good as ReSharper. You know, here we've got 45 test cases for change signature. Uh, ReSharper gets all of them right. Visual SysX, not bad, got about two thirds of them right. And Visual Studio only got like one third of them. You know, there's only 45 test cases. Um, and it's because C++ has tricky syntax for things like, you know, writing a pointer to a member function on a class. You know, that's got lots of asterisks and colons and dots and things in there and parentheses that have to be in just the right place. You know, and it's even more funky if the member function is a pointer to a const volatile member function. So, you know, or it, maybe it has an exception specification on it or something. Those are all part of the method signature. So it's tricky to get right. Um, ReSharper just generally does the best. Now, maybe you are a student, you're using, or you're using Community Edition, you can't or don't want to pay for an add-on. Visual Assist is a commercial add-on. ReSharper for C++ is a commercial add-on. You just want to use Visual Studio. Well, it's not awful. You could do worse. Just be aware of the limitations. Uh, and in particular, uh, Visual Studio and the add-ons for Visual Studio leverage IntelliSense, which is a core Visual Studio feature, to be able to perform the refactorings. So nothing's going to work if you've got IntelliSense turned off. And when you have IntelliSense turned on and you're making code changes in Visual Studio, there's this little squiggly thing down here that tells you background tasks are running. So if you make a change while this little squiggly thing is running that says background tasks are running, that could be IntelliSense trying to update its idea of the structure of your code. And if you attempt to do a rename operation while IntelliSense is updating, it may give you like weird results or it may not work at all. So uh, for any of these tools that are Visual Studio based, it's best to make sure that IntelliSense isn't updating while you're trying to make changes. Uh, if you're going to make a sequence of changes, let IntelliSense settle down between each change so that you get the, the best results from the tool. And, and that was true for, it's true for ReSharper, it's true for Visual SysX. Uh, it's more uh, noticeable with Visual SysX and Visual Studio. ReSharper is smart enough to know when it depends on that update behind the scenes to happen. And when you ask ReSharper to do a refactoring and it needs to wait on that update, it'll put up a little, um, it's not like a balloon bubble, but it's a, it's a little text box notice under your cursor that says ReSharper is thinking. And that's letting you know that it's waiting for that background task to complete before it can invoke the, re, the refactoring operation. It doesn't just proceed ahead blindly because it knows it's just going to fail if the IntelliSense has, uh, internal IntelliSense database hasn't been updated yet. So that's another plus for ReSharper. Now, uh, I didn't mention Clang Tidy. Um, Clang Tidy um, doesn't have tons of refactorings. And you'll see, you know, it has some places where it's failing. You know, why is it failing? And let's just take a look at the Clang tidy types of things. So like replace uh, iterative 4 with range 4. Why does Clang tidy fail on this? This is using the check in Clang tidy. It's called modernize loop convert. Why does it fail? Well, Clang tidy doesn't recognize loops certain kinds of loops. So, for instance, on this one, Clang Tidy will recognize, oh, you're iterating from 0 to 2, 0, you're, you're incrementing i, starting at 0, 
and you're testing against less than two. The size of the container is two, so it can change this into a range for loop, no problem. Same thing here, it's just that Clang Tidy wasn't smart enough to recognize that instead of doing i less than two, you said i less than or equal to one. Did Clang Tidy ever change your code in such a way that it was, uh, you know, resulted in code that changed the meaning or didn't compile? I only found uh, one example of that, and I don't even have a test case for it yet. Um, it's in the Simplify Boolean Expression series of checks. And um, I'm the author of this check. Some other people have contributed to it. I'm the author of this check. And I know that there's been some enhancements to this check that aren't represented by these test cases. I need to add some new test cases. And there's, you know, this uh, nested combination of boolean literals is not recognized yet by clang tidy that's that's just some improvements i'd like to make to the check but it doesn't um make the code wrong it just didn't recognize you see that's why there's no squiggle here these squiggles over here they're coming from readability simplify boolean expression that's the clang tidy check that i authored but over here this was too complicated for it to notice that this whole thing could be simplified to just a single boolean. Now, ReSharper were smart enough to recognize that all this junk could be removed, and that's why ReSharper, if I go over here to the stuff that's kind of ghosted out, remove redundant logical binary expression. That came from ReSharper, not from Clang Tidy. So that's why Clang Tidy doesn't score 100% on some things because uh, Clang Tidy checks the intention is to be conservative, fix what you can, and if you don't recognize it, then leave it alone. So it's test cases where Clang Tidy didn't recognize the structure of it that's causing it to fail, not that it produced uh, invalid code. In fact, if we go down here and look, if we just look at the results here, you know, for simplified Boolean, uh, I didn't add a note, but I, I should go and add a note there that it, it, you know, not recognized as opposed to didn't generate correct code transformation. Uh, so Clang Tidy is a good batch oriented tool. It's also support is integrated into various IDEs. And for rename, there is support for renaming identifiers via Clang, via a tool called Clang D, Clang Daemon. And that has integrations for VI and Emacs, Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code in its documentation claims that it supported some refactorings, but I don't believe that applies to the C++ language support without adding additional specific add-ons to Visual Studio Code. Um, I'm a novice user of Visual Studio Code and I did some experiments to try to see if I could get any refactoring going on with just a plain C++ language support and I, nothing seemed to be available so um, I, don't, I don't know why the I think the documentation might just be talking about C Sharp or, or, or other languages or something that wasn't supported for C++. Um, I did a little survey of developers at my company and developers on the C++ Slack instance and people said they use Visual Studio. They use Visual Studio Code was uh, a high survey result. Like one person said they used Eclipse. I thought Eclipse was being used more widely. I think uh, I think on Linux, if if I, I I tried Eclipse CDT, you know, probably around 2015. I, I didn't find it a satisfying experience. I think Eclipse. Okay, well that, that explains why nobody said they were using it. A lot of people said they were using Visual Studio Code. Um, some people said C Lion. So I, th that was why I wanted to uh, see what the refactoring support was like over there. Um, 
I think I need to do some more experimenting and configure things. Uh, like I said, I'm. Okay, so some more experimentation is required there. Um, you know, somebody said, hey, QT Creator does, you know, refactoring. And I'm like, okay, but, you know, they ran, somebody ran two rename test cases and they both failed. So I, I can't see that that's, I might just drop it because it's, you know, I only have two test cases reporting. Uh, it just doesn't seem like it, 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 it's, it's worth, unless somebody wants to, you know, contribute. The testing, I, I'm not going to go do it. I, I did my surveying uh, for this talk. I didn't find anybody said they use QT Creator. It was in my list of, of things. Um, and like one or two people said Xcode. But Visual Studio Code was a clear winner. Uh, me personally, when I have to code C++ on Linux, I use C-Lion. Uh, it's just awesome. Uh, and and C-Lion now has direct CMake support. So uh, you don't have to use like a, you know, the downside of Eclipse last time I used it was that you had to use an Eclipse project structure and that was only for Eclipse. It wouldn't recognize CMake and, you know, that's just a big bummer at this point. If you're, if you're not able to adapt CMake into your IDE to recognize the project structure, then you're, you're just losing as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I mean, like you get Xcode support and Visual Studio native support by using the Xcode and Visual Studio generators from CMake, right? Um, I, don't, I don't think they have an Eclipse generator. Uh, they never had a C-Lion generator. C-Lion just did it the other way where they just recognized how to run CMake to configure your build uh, from inside C-Lion. And you can manipulate, you know, CMake presets and all that kind of stuff from inside C-Lion. It, it, was, it was fine. Um, so the clear winner is ReSharper for C++. C line, I haven't completed the testing yet, but it's probably going to come in second. And then it's going to be a toss up between Visual Assist X and Visual Studio as to who comes in third. Um, Visual Studio, it's not awful. Um, you know, they're not, you know, it's, uh, you know, 90% on rename. That's not awful. Um, they don't you know, have anything that's in like, you know, well, this down here, it changed signature. <sighs> Visual Studio had problems with change signature. There's only 45 test cases and they're only passing a third of them. But like I said, uh, a lot of those, I just retested the old failures. They still failed. I went and looked at the bugs that I filed in 2017 and they hadn't done anything except close them. So I, I you know, I don't know how to I don't know how to give Visual Studio an incentive to improve their refactoring support other than shaming them. It just doesn't seem to be productive to try to go the normal route. But, like I said, uh, I've been using ReSharper for C++ for poo, maybe almost 10 years now. Um, and it's just awesome. I don't, I don't know what else to say. It, you can get a 30-day a, a free trial. Try it out. If you like it, I recommend a purchase. It's not expensive. Um, if you don't like it, um, use the community edition of Sea Lion, which has almost all the same support. But um, you know, there's a com I believe there's a community edition of Sea Lion that you can use. Uh, I mean, actually, I didn't check if there was a community edition. I just downloaded the 30-day trial for Sea Lion. It's IntelliJ based, and I know there's an IntelliJ community edition. Well, which, why am I asking instead of just Googling it? Sea Lion Community Edition. Let's just see if there is one. Is there one? Uh, apparently not. Yeah, so, sorry. Um, but, um, there is a 30-day trial of Visual Assist X as well. Uh, but if you're in the, uh, you know, can't, don't, can't or don't want to spend any money at all, use the base Visual Studio Community Edition. Um, there's, you know, no difference in terms of refactoring support between the Community Edition and 
the professional edition, it's it's exactly the same, for for better or worse. And uh, that is pretty much the state of affairs for refactoring with C++ code. That's where things stand. Do we have any questions? If, if any of this seems interesting to you and you want to, you know, maybe take, you know, Xcode or Eclipse and, you know, see how good it is, you know, you can try um, forking this repo from GitHub and running through the test cases. I've tried to make uh, things as simple as possible for other people. Um, I've written these, um, this test diffs tool, test names tool, test results, and tool summary to assist you in things, you know, making sure that you're, you know, you got all the test cases reported and so on. Um, I'm, I've been working feverishly on this on the past three weeks, adding new test cases for the, you know, adding all those test cases for rename. I probably added like four or 500 test cases there. Um, I will continue to enhance this for the next couple of weeks, add some more readmes to, to make it uh, easier to understand how to contribute if you want to run some tests and see what it's like. You know, even if you only run five, you know, you don't have to run all 900 rename cases. You can just run five or ten and submit those and we'll incorporate it into the results. And thanks for coming and we will see you again next month.